Hello, my name is Chris Snipes, and you are listening to The Melt. Before we kick things off, let's start with a story from Cammie from Lawrence, Kansas, about today's subject. So, I'd consider myself a pretty chronic agnostic type person. I don't really believe in a lot, but I don't really disbelieve anything either. But sometimes, there's something that you just can't ignore that happens. And the story I'm about to tell started in October of 2016. So that's when my mom died. And my mom was a really interesting person. She was kind of, you know what I would consider a pure-blood hippie. Lots of, you know, tarot cards and lots of talk, uh, nonsensical things I thought were just kind of crazy and out of this world all the time. But anyway, later on that year, actually it was June of 2017, after that, we had... um, decided to buy another house and about two weeks before we moved there was this owl that appeared in our yard now I wouldn't normally think too much of this owl but we had lived in that house for 15 years And not one time had I ever seen or heard an owl. I kind of thought to myself, that is really, really kind of fucked up. I wonder if that's my mom. And the reason, you know, I thought it was my mom initially was because growing up, I always was told by her that her mom was a butterfly. And she would often see a butterfly and say, oh, look, there's my mom. And, and she thought her dad was a, a, a particular dog that we had. And I always kind of brushed this off and, and just kind of thought she was Looney Tunes. And anyway, so it just kind of crossed my mind that it was her. And um, the owl was, was there for you know, close to a two-week period before we moved. And I I kind of mentioned it to my husband. I was like, have you noticed that owl out there? And he's like, yeah, isn't that so fucked up? Don't you think that's your mom? And I was like, yeah, it's like that totally crossed my mind, you know. But being, you know, a pretty rational person just kind of, kind of blew it off. Then we moved in June 2017 and the very first night we were here I got up in the middle of the night and there was an owl just right outside our window just hooting (laughs) and my husband woke up and he's like is that an owl and I was like yeah and then you know I went to the bathroom across the hall and the owl kind of followed me to the other side of the house and was looking in that window. So at this time, I was just kind of like, wow, this is really fucked up. And I 
talked to my dad a few days later and mentioned this to him. And he, you know, was pretty impressed by the whole thing and thought, yeah, maybe it really is my mom. And then some time went by. It was about not long, a week later. And my dad texted me in the middle of the night. Well, like one o'clock in the morning. And he's like, there's an owl outside my window. And, you know, again, this wouldn't be particularly interesting, except the they had lived in that house for about 35 years. And to my knowledge, I had, you know, never noticed an owl before. And he had not noticed an owl before. So the next day I started doing some research and the house that we bought that we had moved into is right next to uh, an old Native American school, a current university, Haskell University. So I just kind of randomly Googled Native American spirit animals. And they have, you know, a certain system that they use similar to what most people are familiar with, uh, with horoscopes. And they have, you know, certain animals based on the day you were born. And sure as shit, my mom's birthday, uh, she was an owl. So this kind of made an impression on me. And and things continued to happen. Um, I think it was September of that year. 2017 there was the um, total solar eclipse and we took a field trip you know somewhere up north in Kansas to view this eclipse Um, and it was a pretty you know special unusual event Um, and we stayed and we started to drive back home after watching the eclipse and it had reached its totality and was coming back the other direction, but that took, you know, a while, over an hour or so. So we were driving and you did feel this eerie feeling just in the air and it was just weird, you know, to have it be dark in the middle of the day and um, there are tons and tons of people up there and traffic was just insane and so we were driving down this dirt road, but it was kind of bumper to bumper traffic. And, you know, we'd drive like five feet and stop for 10 minutes and then drive another five feet, stop for 10 minutes. Um, and during that process, when we were driving, there's this huge owl that was just sitting on this fence post, which, you know, was unusual because. It was the middle of the day, and it was an eclipse. Granted, you know, other birds were out too, but uh, it made an impression on me. And it was, it just stared at us like dead in the eye. And we had some other kids in the car, and they just rolled down the window, and they're like, that owl is just staring at us. <clears throat> anyway, about a month after that, I think it was October of 2017, I uh, have a good friend, a friend I grew up with, and his dog, his dog had died, and he was real close to his dog, and I had kind of just called him one night to tell him I was sorry, and that sucked, and just, you know, be a friend and say hi, and we were just catching up and talking, and, and this friend was uh, one of my mom's favorite people growing up. She wanted me to marry him. She just she just loved this guy. And um, so I was telling him this story about the owl and all the different things that had happened. And he was like, you're kidding me. And I was like, no. I was like, isn't that crazy, you know? And he's like, so I've been sitting outside the past three nights, you know, mourning, crying my eyes out, tears in my beer, smoking cigarettes, feeling sorry for myself because of his dog. And he's like, there's been this owl here 
the whole time, just looking at me and hooting. And he's like, I've never seen an owl before. And I kind of thought, wow. And all I said was, I was like, well, tell her hi. Tell her hi. Long before I'd ever seen Twin Peaks, I had a fascination with owls. I've always found the sound of owls to be comforting. I think that our culture also has a fascination with owls. They're ubiquitous, yet somehow they're always in the peripheral when they're present. Their image can be found in craft kits and in kids' rooms. They can be seen as cute or as menacing. You can find them in any Halloween shop and often hear one of their many sounds in creepy or spooky scenes in films or TV shows. No matter the context, they're always mysterious and undefined. Their presence is accepted without question, perhaps because the imagery of owls has been with us for millennia. They are nocturnal and move in complete silence. Nighttime is also when UFO experiences tend to happen, and these UFOs also move in complete silence. Often, owls and UFO sightings are in conjunction with one another in some way, and it's this connection that led today's guest to attempt to map the vast territory that exists between what we know of owls and what owls really seem to be, or the roles that they are capable of playing in particular situations. Mike Clellan has written many books on backpacking and skiing, but the part of his career that we're focused on today are the two books that he's written about owls and their role as messengers and how they tie into shamans and death, UFOs, and transformation, often involving unexplainable instances of synchronicity. I start off the interview by asking Mike when his interest in owls began. Okay, I'm 56 now. In 2006, I was, I think I'm, I was 44. So do the math. I think that's 12 years ago. And uh, I was in, in Idaho, and I um, befriend. I, I met someone, just a sort of a stranger, and I was just a woman, and her name was Kristen, and I was kind of like, let's um, let's go camping for one night. I lived in a place right near Grand Teton National Park, and that's what people did. They went camping. So she said, sure. So we went out for one night. And we went with very light packs and it was a beautiful night. We didn't bother bringing a shelter. We we're going to sleep out under the stars and um, came a point when like, I'm like, this is kind of a stranger. I don't really know this person. And we're having a conversation and the sun is setting and I'm sitting in a big flat rock and I'm cooking dinner. And, and the, uh, she says something and I'm like, wow, I'm impressed. So depth was spiritual talk basically. And then, and then an owl flew over. And then a second owl, and then a third owl. And then for the next two hours or so, these owls would fly around us, these three owls. They would land near us, they'd swoop down over us, and the sun went down. And then we actually laid our sleeping bags out under the stars, magnificent. And these owls would swoop over us, and they would blot out the stars for just one second. It was totally quiet. It was really remarkable. The owls fly very silently, and so just this blink of an eye, the stars would be blotted out. Um... So afterwards, we were like, wow, that was pretty cool. Oh, whew, owls. And then we, I said, let's, if I go camping again, I'll, let's, and she said, great. If we go, so I called her four days later and said, um, let's, let's go, uh, let's go to a different part of the mountains. We went to a totally different part of the mountains. The sun was setting. We hiked to the top of this hill and an owl flew over us. And then a second owl and then a third owl. And they, f- it was, th- there was just like before, except they were closer. Like they were landing at our feet. They were landing in the branches. It wasn't quite close enough to touch, but they, it was felt remarkably. To have it happen once was pretty cool. To have it happen twice was kind of freaked me out. Um, and there, oh, go on. Didn't you? Didn't you? In the book, didn't you say that you even thought that it might be the same three owls? 
I it's very I I'm, I'm I'm thinking that it might be the same three owls and the, and I have no way to prove of course prove that but that's just my sense they were the short-eared owls a pretty common form of owls and, and it's a form of owls that will occasionally cluster together but it's pretty rare I've talked to owl people like experts ornithologists <laughs> raptor ornithologists and told this story and they look at me like and I'm like does this happen I'm like oh no that doesn't happen <laughs> and um so uh. Right in the moment, I had a voice in my head. I was looking at these real owls. I did not talk about this at the time. I'm talking about it now, right at the time. Looking at these owls, real owls, I had this voice in my head that said, this has something to do with UFOs. Mm -hmm. And this was at a point in my life when I knew I needed to look into some old memories, memories of, from childhood. These memories involved missing time. These memories involved close-up UFO sightings. This memory involved, a, the missing time event had an associated orange bright light in the sky. And, um, and then there was even an event in, in 1993 where I woke up and saw five gray aliens in the yard walking towards the house and they were backlit by this bright light. And I managed to push all of that away. I ignored it. I, I could actually even talk about these stories like around the dinner table. Like here's an interesting story and I would not go there as far as like the next step. Like what does this mean? So, you know, I saw this UFO. Oh yeah, I had missing time. Oh, I saw aliens in my yard. And, and I managed to deny, deny, deny. And so it was the owls, <clears throat> that voice in my head that said, this has something to do with UFOs that sort of pushed me into looking into my own experiences. Now the... um. It's interesting. I just went back and looked at some old notes and some old stuff, and I found some notes that I had written actually very close to the time. And it's one of the things was like the voice in my head said, This has something to do with UFOs. You are an abductee. That's what I heard. And I forgot about that. I'm literally like in the last, you know, I don't know. I've been told the story. I don't know how many times I'm like, Oh, yeah, that's right forgot about that. So this is very strange. You are the ability to like, like keep this stuff at a distance and deny it. And I mean, even now I'm in fully in the throes of researching all this stuff in myself and other people. And I, I, that's a pretty key detail. Mm -hmm. So a few, uh, so that I just started looking into it. I started looking into my own experiences. I started just making phone calls. I started talking to people. I started going to conferences and, uh, and I would ask people, you know, have you ever had any odd experiences with owls? And, and it wasn't a hundred percent, but it was enough that there was a pattern. Now, so in 2009, I started a blog. And one of the first stories is the stories I just told. It was this woman, Kristen, and camping in the owls. And, and, I, and I put it up and it was like that one detail. It's like, what were we talking about the moment we saw those owls? So I contacted her and said, what, you know, what were we talking about at that moment when we saw those owls? And she, the, the first night, she said, oh, I remember exactly what we were talking about. I was giving my most heartfelt definition of what God means to me. Hmm. Now, I'm not at all churchy in anything, but, but um, it, it's not in me to be like, you know, like I'm not religious in the slightest, but sure. that detail like kind of added a level of depth to it that I didn't expect. And I, and I, and I recognized it and I have taken this work very, very seriously since then. And, um, and since the advent of the blog, I have been talking about owls. I've been writing essays about owls. And so if you Google, if you're anywhere in the world and you, yeah, I'm two mouse clicks away because if you Google owls, UFOs, I am the first thing that comes up and then I'm about the next 15 things that come up after that. So why do you think, it, what do you think it was with the owls that clicked all of that into place? Well, I couldn't any from, you know, on the continuum, it could be complete chance. And on the other end, it could have been totally orchestrated by who's ever on the other side of the curtain, sure, you know, sure. so whether that's the, you know, the synchronicity fairies or whether that's the <laughs> UFO occupants, I don't know. So uh, yeah. So you asked a very good question. I, my senses, and I'm saying this cautiously because I don't know, but my sense is that this is a, in a weird way played out in almost like, um, like a real linear journey. Like it has almost a storyline. And I guess anyone's life, you know, in retrospect, you could say it's, oh, it's laid out like a novel or something like that. But this really feels weird to me. Like my life turned, my life changed that day 
in the mountains and it has never gone back. Were you, I know, and that's when the, when you were sort of became plagued by synchronicities, were, were do you, did you ever really pay much mind to synchronicities before then? Yeah, and I had actually, and it was just, it was actually kind of like, like the owl, it didn't like go straight up like that. Leading up to that owl thing, I was having a lot of synchronicities. So um, interestingly enough, Kristen was too. She talked about it. You know, she had a lot of synchronicities in her life. Like I would sort of talk about my synchronicities and she'd give me this look like, live my life, you know? And uh, so, yes, yeah, so the synchronicity thing played into it too. So the title of the first book is Owls, or The Messengers, the subtitle is Owls, Synchronicity, and the UFO Abductee. So, um, and the synchronicities are in a way just as magical as the owls are. And I, I really try to follow those synchronicities. Um, uh, there's a fellow named Alan Green. He wrote a book. He's edited a series of books called The Sync Book, and he had a podcast and website. He's a really powerful sync researcher into synchronicities. He, I'm, I'm making, I'm like, I'm holding a compass right now. He, he says uh, synchronicity is like having a compass. Like you need a compass on an open boat on a cloudy day, out in the ocean, right? Mm-hmm. There's no way to get your bearings. So if you have a compass, you you have a direction to travel, and so he says that's how I use synchronicity. It's my compass. Interesting. So I've started like making my life decisions on these synchronicities. So it was, you know, like all of a sudden I was confronted with this powerful event. And I'm like, I got to follow this. Mm-hmm. And it has been rewarding. It's not really rewarding financially, but it's been certainly <laughs> rewarding like emotionally. And kind of, I feel like I've really, it's been really exciting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So something about that sort of connected that circuitry together that allowed you to realize how important and impactful these synchronicities could be in your life. Well, they were overly impactful for a while. There was a few years ago, a few years, and I actually even say it like between about 2007 and 2006, really starting with the owl thing, about 2006 to about 2011, I like spent 95% of my waking hours wondering if I had gone insane. That's, that's, that's pretty accurate. Sure. And it was just these, it was so powerful. It was just going, hitting me so hard day after day. There was these, the people who worked at the health food store in the little town, you know, this little main street health food store. And I, they were all my friends, you know, a counter, you could sit there and stuff. And I would just go in every day. It felt like I went in there every day and just said, this other thing happened today. And it was like this, and it was related to this. And it took, I mean, a really in-depth synchronicity takes about 20 minutes to tell. Like it's not, I mean, t- there's so many little interlocking things sure. and, and, all of it felt like it was somehow connected either to UFOs or owls. And, and it drove you crazy because it, you started to not be able to tell whether you were just what was significant and what wasn't? Or Well, more that consensus reality said, this can't happen. Mm-hmm. So the editors of the New York Times says, this can't happen. You know, my high school science teacher says, this can't happen. But it was happening. So it was a paradigm sort of confrontation. I was in a place of tension because the you know whatever life the instruction book of life had told me one thing, and it didn't match what I was experiencing. Yeah, I can imagine. Insane. So that definitely put owls on your radar. Those two events. Oh, they were way on my radar. They were front and center, and they were like it was just owls, owls, owls for <laughs> since that point. Um, I mean, it's a little bit. I mean, I go into dreams and deer and other animals and meditation, and there's other things that that are associated with the uh, with the owl. Um, but uh, but yeah, so for some reason, I just got stuck on this, and it's been really interesting because in a way. Um, You know, like if you were like a junior high school history teacher and a student came up and said, I'm going to do my report on World War II, you would kind of go like, oh, don't do that. That's a little, you're biting off something big there. So, and then you would say, I'm going to do it on, you know, the Pacific campaigns. And I'm like, okay, good. And then I'm going to do it on one island. I'm going to do it on one Navy boat. I'm going to do it about one person's experience on one day. And you'd go, yes, narrow it down, narrow it down, narrow it. And then you'll get an interesting, uh, uh, you know, way to tackle something enormous i mean the ufo thing is enormous and the thought so i am dealing with the tiniest 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 little fractal corner edge the most insignificant part of the ufo thing i'm pulling on that one thread and it is endless it is the it is a bottomless pit of amazing amazing stories and the stories all have their own sort of unique flavor to them i mean there's like sort of a consistency to the mood of these stories 
um, so yeah, so I'm, I feel blessed in a way that I got handed this cause I would have been all over the map. I just know enough about myself to know <laughs> I would be totally scattered if I was trying to research this and didn't have a, uh, like a handrail to guide me. Sure. So. The universe said, let's give him this focus. Let's give him the exactly. <laughs> and thank goodness for the universe for doing that. Cause I would have been all over the map. I mean, I still, I'm still a generalist as far as my overall knowledge of the stuff, but, um, I feel like a very obsessive specialist in this one little corner. Yeah. Good for you. And it's, it pays off. Obviously I have to- totally enjoyed the, the first book is all that I've read so far, but it was just absolutely compelling. And I've always been drawn to owls too. So, I mean, owls are, owls are remarkable animals. I mean, they are not like seeing a bunny, you know, I mean, they're like people, I mean, you know, obviously there's owls all over the place, right? So you can see an owl and there's no paranormal, there's no UFOs involved. You can, you're allowed to see an owl and you don't have to read too much into it. There's, they're out there. So, but um, uh, if you, I mean, if I, cause I talk to people all the time and they're just like, you know, I saw an owl. It was on the fence post. It was remarkable. I mean, they don't know that. That's like, it's, it's got a power and I recognize it and, and I'm certain ancient man recognized it too. And so my, the, the way I'm presently framing this is that um, the, there's myths that have been in place. This is more, this is more a continuation of my own studies that came out of the second book that there's ancient myths in place about the owl. And those are consistent somewhat all across the world. But and I'm, what I'm finding is like consistency. So my sense is like these ancient myths are based on real experiences. So ancient man was having the same experiences that I'm getting, right? Instead of emailing to me, they would go to the, you know, they would go to the edge of the village and sort of knock on the teepee and ask the elder, you know, like, what does this mean? I just saw an owl. And obviously there's all kinds of ways to, um, interpret the, the meaning and I think it's deeply personal but but my sense is the owl is the totem of on one sense it's the owl of the totem of the transformational experience or another way to look at it which is it often is owl is not a light and fluffy totem like it's handing you a, a message of intensity and, and challenge yeah. and um and that's exactly what it's been for me you know I saw those owls real owls in the mountains with Kristen the message I got is this has something to do with UFOs. That was a message. It was a messenger. It delivered the message and it has been difficult, challenging, but at the same time, really rewarding for me personally. I may revise that if I'm still spinning my wheels <laughs> 10 years from now. To think. <laughs> um, the people will be rolling their eyes going, oh, the owl guy. Shut him up. Jesus shut him up. Yeah. So, um, I'm not sending him one more. He's not going to get another owl coffee cup. <laughs> <laughs> Did you... Did, did, so did those two experiences uh, cause you to start the blog or did you already have the blog after that? Oh, no, that? no, the, the two experiences, it was more, the, so what happened was the two experiences with the owls caused me to look into my experiences mm-hmm. and looking into my own experiences, I started, I would just would shameless for a while. I would just call up, I got a hold of Bud Hopkins. I went to New York, I got hypnotized and nothing really emerged from that. He was actually quite ill at that point. Um, so, but I, I, I started the journey. I started going to UFO conferences. I started meeting people who've had these experiences. So that's what, you know, the, the owls merely pushed me in that direction. Mm -hmm. So the blog came from trying to look at my own experiences. And I I had, uh, I sat at this tacky casino cafeteria thing with this woman named Miriam Delicato. And she, um, and I kind of said, what do I do? You know, like I'm, I kind of gave her the rundown of some of the stories and things that had been happening in my life and memories. And she said, you know, you should probably talk about this stuff. So I went home and made a blog. And that was really strange. In retrospect, it's very strange that I went and did that. It was a very bold thing to do. In what sense? Because that's not something you would usually do. I was, I was real time giving my experiences. I was, I mean, like I was, I was in a public forum sure. talking about the, my insecurities and my I mean, it was like, you know, I used to make a th- joke that, you know, don't, you don't need to, all this stuff with, I mean, this was kind of the, you don't need to torture anyone to get, you know, to get the insight, you know, just take them to Guantanamo. Don't, you know, don't put them in a, in a, in a torture chamber. Just give them a blog, give them a laptop computer and have them start a blog and they'll spill their guts. And that's what I did. It was very strange. And um, so, and that, and I'm actually working right now. I'm sort of going through a bunch of old blog posts and stuff right now that I haven't read in 
10 years or close to 10 years. And I'm shocked at the, at the, how much I'm gushing, you know? So I was, yeah, you can just, it's, you don't have to read between the lines to see that I was struggling and confused and stuff like that. So it makes for interesting reading, but I've definitely come a long way in the last nine years. So. And was probably very therapeutic during that time too, right? And it was, I met people and people came to my rescue in a way and people were very supportive. And, and so I made friends through the, the blog and everything like that. Yeah. yeah. Cool. And so then you started, then people started writing you with their stories. Yep. I used to get about, I used to get a few a week, then I got about one a day and now I'm getting about three a day. Mm-hmm. Still. And you do the math and it is impossible. I mean, some people send these long, amazing stories. I'm, I'm really grateful they send them, but I just feel terrible that I can't respond in a meaningful way. Sure. Well, you can say that they'll hear you during these podcasts and go, okay, at least he's thinking about us. I probably have put a little, I have a little form letter, which I, I feel terrible replying with. Sure, but. sure. Well, and then during uh, amassing all of these owl experiences and, and looking at your own, you sort of started dividing them up into two categories, right? Like the four foot owls oh. and the, the screen memories, the four foot tall owls. Mm-hmm. And so some people are seeing four foot tall owls. I've got some wonderful stories about, you know, what's very typical is someone's driving home late at night, lonely road. They turn a corner. There's a big owl in the road. They pull right up to it. Looks over the hood of their car. I've got this so many times. It's unbelievable. It looks at them over the hood of the car. Like you can take the smallest car and the biggest owl and it ain't going to look over the hood of the car. So and then they like, oh, and then they kind of drive on and they get home and they're two hours late. I'm like, well, I should have been home at midnight. It's two in the morning. Um, if they go through hypnotic regression, I'm generalizing greatly. I could tell any number of stories in detail, but this is kind of a generalization. Um, they go to a hypnotherapist and the hypnotherapist says, you know, like describes this owl. They say, well, it's skinny and it's got a big bald head and these big black eyes and it's got a shiny space suit on and I don't think it's an owl. So the implication is that, and there's all kinds of issues with hypnosis, but the implication is that the the UFO occupants are somehow using the owl as a as a disguise, as a psychic disguise. They're using either through technology or through psychic means. They are they're putting a screen in the mind of the viewer, and the, instead of seeing a scary gray alien, which would be frightening, they are instead seeing an owl, which is something they may or may not see. And it's a little, but the four foot tall, it's shocking. So I, this, I made a cardboard four foot tall owl. I took pictures of it mm-hmm. and I went out on a lonely road. It was dark. It was spooky. It was a rural road. And I put this owl out in front of the car and I kind of wanted to take some pictures. So I moved closer and backed up and stuff. And let me tell you, there's no way because it was, I measured it four feet tall. Some people say four and a half. Some people say five. Some people say three and a half. I think they're generally saying essentially the same thing. But let me tell you, if, if there's no way you can look at that and just kind of go, oh, I saw a four foot tall owl. You know, it would be like, it, so. But they do though. They, they seem unfazed they, by yeah, it, right? Yeah. Is, so that tells me that there is some form of like mind control at play mm-hmm. that can allow people to be so dismissive of the of the event yeah sort of like the same unfazedness that you had when you had the experience with the the grays out in your backyard right when i saw this so this would have been 1993 i would have been 30 years old it was probably january or february of 1993 i woke up in the middle of the night i sat up on my elbow the window was was right up against the bed and i looked out the window and there was the bright light coming through and i saw five gray aliens walking towards the 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 house backlit by a bright light now the bright light was if it was a big flying saucer that would have been perfect it wasn't it looked like about the size of a washing machine or something Mm -hmm. um i looked at these beings and i had this voice i mean this is terrifying right i was so calm i had this voice in my head that said now is the time to put your head on the pillow and shut down you know what it was actually was it was oh yes they're here now is the time to put your head on the pillow and shut down wow and there was a sense, and I, this is actually the one thing that did come out of the hypnosis session with Bud Hopkins. There was a palpable sense of knowing, like, oh, it's them again. Like, oh, oh, they're back. It's them again. It's very, very, very calm. Mm-hmm. Like the same, you know, like, oh, it's, you know, Aunt Helen and Uncle, J- Uncle F- Frank coming at Easter time for dinner. They come all the time. I just thought, there they are. They're in the driveway. And so um, there was, and I was, and I put my head on the pillow and I was out instantly. Um, This, if you've done any kind of research into the abduction lore, this is, 
this is commonplace. But um, what really struck me was that there was this otherworldly quality to that event. There was this eerie silence. There was this hyper clarity. There was this kind of blankness of thought in a way. It was, it was dreamlike to a degree, but I don't think it was a dream. Mm-hmm. At the time, I dismissed it entirely as a dream. Like the next morning, I didn't even go out and to look if there were footprints in the snow. You know, why would I? It was impossible. It was just my imagination it was a dream. Um, now, I've talked to other people, and one of the questions I ask I'll, uh, is, this, is, have you ever had this odd, distorted sense of, of reality? And I've talked to UFO researchers, and they'll just say, oh, you were in another reality. You were in a distorted reality. You were in another reality at the time. You know, like, I don't know what that means. That's such a, you know, like, so I'm like, okay. Which, but that's... But what it told me is that the instru- the uh, this was Dave Jacobs actually who told me that, mm-hmm. and and um, and what it told me was that he's heard this many many times. This sense of sometimes it gets called the Oz factor. Mm-hmm. Um, but I had one woman explain it to me, and she said, "I said, have you ever had this sensation? She had an event in a car, and so she was parked in this car. So she said, you know, like when you're you have two magnets, right, and you." They click together and then you pull them apart and turn one the opposite way. And then they, instead of, then you can't push them together. They're, they're repelling each other. When you push them together and try hard, there's this kind of warbly kind of energy that's palpable. There's nothing there, but there's, it's palpable. You can feel this warbling energy. She said, you know what it was like? It was like being in between those two magnets. And when she said that, I was like, oh, you know, you know, you and I know we're talking about the same thing. That was the perfect explanation for it. Um, so yes, yeah, so there's a that was a long story, and that was in essence to reply to that that eerie, irrational calmness, yeah, the complacency almost, like yeah. yeah, like a lab animal getting put to put down before the experiment or something. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what I mean. So I don't know. I'm like I, the uh, and I've heard that many many times. Mm-hmm. Obviously, sure, are like sure, you know, like basically they'll say it was so weird. We were like, oh yes, there's a UFO. You know, everyone in the car just was like, oh, let's keep going. Let's go. Time to go. Like your once in a lifetime event and you're like, okay, let's go home now. Humans are so easily hypnotized. I think there's something's going on. Yeah. yeah. My sense is there's somebody's controlling us on a dial from some other place, whether through psychic means or through technological means. Yeah. I have no idea. Yeah. There's also the, the concept of owls sort of as like a sort of like a surveillance camera, like an alien surveillance camera. This is a wonderful avenue of thought. I don't know how valid it is. It's totally fun to think about this, but I don't know. So if you had to choose, if you were, so here, I'll tell a second, another story. So this woman get, gets a hold of me and she has a powerful missing time event. She's driving on the interstate in the East Coast and all of a sudden she's driving along and boom, she comes to and she's like behind this big pile of rocks in her car, like this big gravel pile. And she kind of drives around at some sort of job site and she comes out and she just drives and drives and drives and finally finds her way back onto the interstate again. She's... I think she actually gained time or something like that. She was further ahead than she should have been. And, and she was, but after that, she started hearing all these voices in her head and she felt like it was her ancestors, like her ancient ancestors. And they're all saying, get into shamanism. You need to become a shaman. And, and then they, they said, can you go to the tea aisle in the grocery store? She said, okay. So she goes to the tea aisle and she said, read every box, read the ingredients in every box and look at the words. So she'd pick up the box and she'd read. And it was felt like there was a whole chorus of, of ancestors. And she would read the box and it would be like um, mint, lemongrass, ginger. And she could like hear these voices in the background going, oh, mm, oh. Mm. <laughs> and the implication is that like these ancient ancestors are in a realm where they can't drink tea anymore. Yeah, yeah. And so, so if they, if they, if who's ever at play here can't, maybe it's very difficult for them to be here. And if they had to choose one animal, right? So here's this lady, she's there looking through her eyes, reading the ingredients of the tea box. If there's one animal in all of God's creation, that would be the perfect animal it would be an owl, right? It flies silently it's got this, you can see in the dark. It's got amazing hearing. So it's like an owl, if an owl is sitting on my window right now, it could hear our conversation perfectly. And if I saw an owl, I would, you know, wouldn't be the, I would say, oh, that's interesting. There's an owl out there, but I wouldn't, you know, it's not like seeing a, you know, a, like a, you know, a Russian in a trench coat with a microphone up against the window. A gazelle so, or something. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Unless I was in Africa, a gazelle might be a little. <laughs> yes, you know, so. exactly. 
Yeah, and I didn't realize before your book how owls' eyes are designed. They would make perfect cameras. I know. It's very funny. I went through, I made a really long, 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 uh, uh, called owl physiology chapter. Yeah. And I love like, that. Can you read the book for me? And then like, like the people would say, Oh, you got to cut that down. The owl physiology chapters went on and on. And I was like, <laughs> I cut it down. So here we got about one third of the, uh, of two thirds is in a file somewhere. But, um, but so I'll send it to you if you want. I want the <laughs> so, director's cut of the book. <laughs> okay. So be careful what you wish for. So, so owl's eyes, like, so we, so we can go like this, right? We can look right and left because our eye, we have eyeballs. They're spheres. They're spheres. We have a little musculature that can turn them. Owls don't have that. Owls can only look one way. They're locked forward. And that's all you get. So that's where you get that eerie stare. But also that's where owls get that incredibly bizarre, like stillness, that robotic stillness, how they turn their head. That comes from the fact that they can't move their eyes and they can, and they, their eyes and ears are used in tandem. So like an owl in flight. So imagine this, an owl in flight in the dark, flying over a field, is listening for mice in flight in the dark. And if they hear a mouse, they have enough, uh, I don't know, it's binocular vision when you have two. I guess uh, uh, stereo, they have enough stereoscopic that they can, their ears, our ears are on the side, their ears point forward in matching their eyes. So they can they can kind of, you know, target their eyes and ears and catch a mouse under the grass or even under snow in flight wow. in the, in darkness. There was some experiments where they did, and I'm, I think I'm doing this correctly. I'll do the, I'll do the percentages, um, which I'll fudge a little bit cause I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's pretty close. Uh, scientists took a, like a giant gymnasium and built it totally light tight it was they could test it there was not a speck of light that could get in and they had owls up in the rafters and they had mice on the floor and in total darkness 100 percent darkness the owls had figured out the how far away the floor was and everything like that so mm-hmm. the owls would catch the mice 75 percent of the time wow. they would put a tiny bit of available light in or like they would just use they would use to, you know they would in introduce a tiny bit of light, much, much, much lower. For all, we would just perceive it as absolute darkness. Yeah, sure. And that very quickly went up to 100%. Wow. So, so that tells what it told the scientists is that owls depend on their ears as far as their hunting. Sure, sure. That's amazing. I didn't know yeah, it's, re- oh yeah, so they're remarkable animals. And their, their eyes are cylindrical too, right? Like little mushrooms. Yeah, that's crazy. Little mushrooms. So they, they um, and uh, they, uh, because, they we have light receptors and color receptors. They don't have any color receptors. It's all light receptors, and so the the shape of the eye. I'm not a, like a ophthalmologist or anything like that, but the shape of the eye allows for many many more um, uh, light recepting. Uh, I can't remember whether cones or rods within their eyes, and so they pack them in there, and just the way it frames them, so that the owls can see in near complete darkness. So there's just starlight is plenty for them to see in the dark forest. I mean, they're flying around between the trees, between branches in the middle of the night, in the darkest, darkest night, no problem at all. And so in the ancient mythology, so I think ancient man recognized this. I mean, I think since the advent of the electric light bulb, prior to that, nighttime had a different meaning to our ancestors. So nighttime was, you know, the demons and death and, and foreboding and, you know, daylight was, you know, so it has a totally different feel than we have now. Mm-hmm. But um, owls, so the ancient man would understand that owls can fly into the darkness. And in all the worlds, not all the worlds, but in, in a great number of the world's mythologies, the owl would fly into the other realms. Flying into the darkness became a metaphor for transferring into those other realms land of the dead, the land of the gods. And then they would come back and they would bring a messenger. They would, and I, you know, what's happening when I was like, I had to pick a name for the book and I just had story after story. And people would say, they would say, you know, like the owl came and landed on my back porch. And then the next sentence, so then the messenger, and they would just call it the messenger. And that happened a lot. So I was, it was like, it kind of, that name that just became the, the title at that point when I, when I started seeing that pattern. Yeah, yeah, it just made sense. So you also recount a lot of uh, instances where people actually get 
sort of psychic downloads from owls, right? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes <laughs> this is kind of, I did an interview a while ago, and this guy was having none of it. it was like one of these interviews that totally tanked. He was like <laughs> a nuts and bolts researcher, and I'm like, like, and so I mean, I so when in the book, I'm very at peace with saying if someone tells me a story, I won't. I didn't put anything in the book unless it had a pattern, unless there was a few more things in the files that matched it, and I would just kind of pick the best example of that thing. And so this one woman she's lying in bed and this owl lands out her window and she says the owl stares at her. It's in an owl size in a branch outside her window. It stares at her. This blue laser beam comes and hits the owl at the top of the head, comes out of the owl's third eye and then boom into her third eye. And she's downloaded with this, this thing and typical of this stuff. And I'm like, what was the download? And this, well, I don't really know. I can't remember. I think I'll know when the time is right. I get that all the time. I don't know what, I mean, this is, that's normal that to hear that. Um, so yes, yeah, so the people get these downloads. I have a wonderful story where a woman um, was hiking in the woods and and uh, her name is Karis. And she's she's like, I knew I was going to see an alien that day. I knew this was the day. She had all these experiences. She'd never seen an alien. And she so I'm going to see an alien today. And she's in the woods. She's walking in the woods. And she's kind of like, oh, well, um, I'll just leave the, I'm just going to walk off the, the trail and walk through the woods for a little bit. So she's like, walks through and she said it was really hard she had to push her way through the bushes and stuff and then she's like oh i'm now i need to stop i'll just sit on this rock and she was kind of like oh but not here a, a little bit over this oh but not that far over a little bit here mm -hmm. and then she's so she's sitting there like why am i doing this why did i end up here and she realized she's lined up the bushes it kind of drops down there's a gully and comes back up again and there's these bushes right across from her and in the one available little tunnel in the bushes she's staring eye to eye with this great horned owl wow and she had been doing a lot of fairy research, like ancient fairy mythologies and stuff like that at that point. And she looked at this thing. And in her mind, she said, are you, are you alien or are you a fairy? And the owl telepathically said, I'm both like you. And, and, so that was like a perfect answer. I think I'm not getting that quite right, but that was. Oh, so I think was it? No, did he say? Uh, uh, do I have to be one? Do I have to be one of the something like that? Yes, yeah. yes. I could look it up. I apologize. No, that's um, okay. Yes. So, so, but it basically was implying that she was both an alien and a fairy, and and uh, okay. So, so here's what it was. So she says, "Are you an alien or a fairy?" And said, "Like, why can't I'm? Why can't I be both? You're both." Yeah. So. And then she proceeded to tell this download that came, which just went on and on and on. I had it recorded and I listened to it recently and it was so trippy. And so, and it would almost be to tell that story correctly would have been its own novel. So this was, that was the, that was the, that was the, that's what broke my heart with, with writing the, the first book, because I would tell these stories, you know, and they'd be two or three paragraphs long. Some of them might be a page long. And there was so much more to every one of these stories. Like you talk to someone on the phone for six hours and then you sum it up in a few paragraphs. It broke my heart. But that was the reason I wrote the second book because it allowed me to tell those more complex stories more, much more thoroughly. Sure. And, and uh, because I think those are important. And I think there's a, that in a way is the, you know, the people who are having these experiences are, they're all over the map. They're, they're irrational. They're, they're absurd. They're chaotic, and um, and I and everyone has this the same pattern almost of this absurdity quality to their to their to their experiences. And a, there seems to be a reoccurring theme of owls having to something to do with initiation too, shamans. Well, sh so yes, yeah, so here's the when I the uh, shamanic initiation. Yeah, that shows up all the time. I mean, shamans know about it, right? You could talk about like. I mean, there's lots of shamans around. It's not, it's not a de dead art or anything like that. It's not, it's, you know, people don't, you know, it's hard to look up in the phone book in the yellow pages. <laughs> but um, so yeah, this, the owl, it would be the totem animal of the shaman, which is perfect, right? So that's what a shamanic journey is, right? You go, you go through, you beat the drum, you, you go into a cave, you take ayahuasca. I mean, there's any number of ways to, to go to that altered state to pass beyond the veil and then return. And then that's what's, required you have to return with the message so i mean that's the shaman's role right someone in the village says oh i'm going through this crisis and and i need help and the shaman would then journey for that that tribe member so um and the initiation so that's something that came out of a of a discussion i had 
with uh, a woman named um, Jacqueline Smith, not the Charlie's Angels, Jacqueline Smith. And she, <laughs> she, uh, she had a, um, she wrote this amazing, wonderful book. Um, she's an animal communicator. So she has one book out. It's all about animal communications, talking with horses, helping families, talking to dogs and cats. She had a second book, which was all communications with animals, porpoises, turtles, dogs. And one of them was an owl. So I got the book. I got to read the owl chapter in this thing. It was really interesting. And it was the same thing. It was this, it was to quote it completely. It just, it spins into this kind of nether world of, 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 um, I don't, I mean, absurd is the wrong word, but it gets so deep that it's almost like it's hard to follow at a certain point. So, and I'm talking to her on the phone and it's like, what's your third book on? She said, oh, my UFO contact experiences. And I'm like, okay, so the person is, you kind of, you know, she's, she's also a UFO abductee. She doesn't like that word. And she told me when I said it. So, uh, and, um, and, and I said, listen, you, when you talk to those owls, you see that owl again, because she has a story about like meeting this owl in the woods and it would be there every day. And then she said, one day she said, do you have a message for me? And then she, boom, she said with this download. Um, and that was the chapter of the book. It's a wonderful book. Uh, and so I said, if you see that owl again, you ask for me, what's up with the, what's up with the owls? Cause I got to know. And we're talking and all of a sudden she starts talking very haltingly and really slow and her cadence is totally different. And she's channeling, she's channeling the owl for me on the phone. I'm so glad I recorded this. And she said a couple of things. She said, like when people are having UFO contact, the owl is there to lessen the impact. There's an archetypal reason that owls are there. And they're, the UFO occupants are choosing the owl for an archetypal reason. She said this in two sentences. I, I couldn't do it justice off the top of my head. But she said, within our DNA, within our, our souls, we, have a, we understand the meaning of the owl in a different way than our conscious mind. And we all have that. And it was a perfect definition of the archetype, right? So you're understanding the meaning of this, this totally normal terrestrial animal. You're understanding it with a new depth. And we, I think it's, it's within all of us. Um, though it's very, I can only dance around what the, what the, what the archetypal meaning may be. And then she, so she said, yes, so they're, and they arrive at the time. So it's very common for people to say, oh, I was walking through the woods and I looked up at a tree and there was this owl and the owl flew off and then this flying saucer went over. That's normal. I get that a lot in one form or another. Mm -hmm. um, and she says the owl is there to announce initiation. When it was like, when she said that, and when she said the archetype thing and announce initiation, it felt like every messy thing in my, in my research just went click. You know, it was like, it was like the last part of the doing the crossword of the puzzle where click, 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 all the pieces fell in place. And, and I was like, that's perfect. Now I don't know if it's true just cause it felt good and it, you know, that doesn't make it true. So I'm, but I'm saying that was a wonderful juicy tidbit to, to, to get from a channeled from someone who was like talking in a slow broken cadence. Basically it felt like she gave me the key. Yeah. So, um, Yes, yeah, so that so I, and I got to do this off the top of my head. Richard Dolan was my publisher, and he was like, "Mike, Mike, you got it, you got it." People ask you all the time, "What is the meaning of the owls?" And I used to be, I don't know, like it's like you can't do that anymore. So I have to have an answer. So the answer would be there's four things: the owls an alarm clock. It's here to wake us up. I saw those owls in the mountains with, in in 2006. They woke me up. The owl is here to announce initiation, just like I said, right? So the initiate. This is you know if you're if you're if you are working with a shaman in the plains of South Dakota and you're an apprentice to be a, the next shaman of the village, you are, you're going to see owls. Um, the third was, um, it is the totem of the transformational experience. So there's other things that owls are, owls and death are very common. So the death is like the ultimate transformational experience. You see, you have a powerful UFO experience. You're going to be transformed. You're not going to be the same person after that. Sure. Um, and I got to do the third one. I can't remember. The, oh, the fourth one, excuse me. I could look it up. The book's right over there, but um, I'll, 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 it'll come to me in a second. Yeah, it'll so. come. We've got time. But so these could be initiations into all different kinds of things that could be initiation to this interaction that somebody might be starting to have with aliens or whatever the, the whatever's coming to us in, in the UFOs. 
or what's ever coming to us within the the shamanic practice or the yogic practice or you know I, so I'm, i think that there's the, it shows up with other things meditation i have this wonderful story of a guy no ufos at all in this he's out in his field he's he's uh he's um he's french canadian so he wrote it to me and he said he he likes to meditate outside so he sits outside and before he meditated he stood up and he like announced to the sky he said i want to be i want to help with the upliftment of mankind it bugged me because upliftment there's no word it doesn't it's spell check I'm done like so so i want to help with the upliftment of mankind i want to help i want to be part of the upliftment of mankind he sits down and meditates and then he opens his eyes and there's these ravens he's in the tall grass in, the, in a sort of field and there's these ravens he stands up and there's an owl under the ravens that the ravens are harassing which is very common and um so he he, he asks this question. He makes a declarative statement. I want to be of service to mankind. This owl shows up. I mean, this is, so here, I'll give, this is one I just got. And I have to be very cautious because the fellow did not give me permission for this. But uh, he was a boy at the time and he's flying a kite. And this, these things have the story. This feels like a fable, right? He's flying a kite as a boy. Something has never happened. A huge gust of wind comes along. and takes the ball of string out of his hand and the string goes into the woods. And he, so the next day he wants his kite back, right? So he goes into the field the next day, the woods the next day and searches in the woods and sees his kite at the top of the tree. So him and his buddy go to the top of the tree and there's up there, how are we going to get the kite down? And he basically feels this tapping on his leg and he looks down and there's an owl all wrapped in the string of the kite. So it's his kite, his string, and he finds an owl. So we talk and we talk and we exchange a few letters back and forth. And I kind of say, listen, have you been doing any shamanic initiation or are you doing any sort of shamanic practices? And there was, you could say like, uh, that's a really long answer. The short answer would be yes. <laughs> so here's a guy who's seen UFO, he's part of, he's also seen UFOs, has this experience as a boy. Now, if I was like writing this in a Disney movie, right? And like kind of like the script writer, the executive producer would come into the script writing office and say, you know, the thing with the owl and the string, that's way too over the top. No one's going to believe that. Exactly. So, so these stories are, are showing up with this mythic quality that I just find. It's so powerful for me it's hard to put your finger on it right sure i mean that story is kind of open-ended but wow and i get it all the time just it just i don't know that's the problem is i can't tell some of these stories in just in a little one-off like this sometimes it takes a long time to tell them yeah exactly and and it's come to the point where you have even started playing a role in people's synchronicities too right like sometimes people are listening to your talks or opening your book or right, so so the, the book was originally I did an essay in 2013. The essay is about 40 pages long. The book's about 400 pages long. So the essay just got multiplied by 10 basically. And it's, an, it's so that the, everything in the essay is in the book. But um, so I did, and a couple of people got back to me and said, this has to be a book, but it was, it was very popular. So people would read it online. And this one woman said, I printed it out and I was reading the essay and it was 10 pages, didn't take that long to read. So, or excuse me, 40 pages, didn't take that long to read. And uh, so she would read it and there'd be an owl hooting outside. She would set it down and would stop. And she'd start reading and the owl would hoot outside. She said, and it, and she was doing it to her, showing her husband, like, listen, watch what happens. I'll just read this. The owl would, and she'd set it down. And then when she was done, the owl never came back. So I have, in the second book, I have a story there's a fellow, his name is Mike C, like myself. He's coming home from, a, uh, from work. He's, he's crossed bridge. He cro gets across the bridge. He's in downtown traffic in an urban area in, in Massachusetts and crosses the bridge and an owl <laughs> flies right across his windshield. Scares, he says, scares the crap out of me. And he turns and, and gets onto the, the Route 5 and then within like a half a mile, there's a, hovering flying saucer above this industrial park and he's caught in traffic and he's looking at this thing and it just kind of moves through traffic and this thing floats up he says it's about the size of a football field no one stopped no one was looking at it i just got pulled along through traffic and he says oh yeah and by the way i was listening to one of your talks 
through this whole thing. I downloaded it on my MP3. I'm like, wait, 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 wait. You were, you were, you saw an owl and a UFO while listening to my voice talking about owls and UFOs? He said, yeah. Wow. Now, this story just goes on and on and on. Every little imaginable part of the story has a synchronicity. Every, it felt like every... <laughs> text thing we said to each other was at one, two, three, four, at 1234, at 333. And, and it was just, but the thing that struck me about that more than anything was he had crossed a bridge, right? So this is like, this is, if, so if someone, if you're the dream interpreter and said, I crossed a bridge and I saw an owl. Well, the bridge in the dream is just as important in the, as the owl. Mm-hmm. So you have two mythic, iconic, symbolic things, you know, the bridge, the owl. So I'm at the point now where I, I take that stuff seriously and it makes some people crazy, but I don't care. I mean, I just, it's like, this is what's presenting itself to me. And this is, these are the threads I want to pull on. It's been very fruitful to pull on these threads in the sense that, that the stuff that's emerging from, from going into these deeper levels, like looking at reality as if it's a dream has been remarkably, I mean, it's, it's been, if on one level, it's been seductive and fun. And on the other level, it feels like I'm, like I'm onto something. Now I may be totally, you know, lost in this but this is how it feels oh i don't think so if so then there's hordes of people that are lost also it seems too way too big to be something that you you didn't just want well i mean the the mythic imagery of it like i'm like i'm all for like trying to pick that out and i'm just i you know i'm i obviously i know i'm like you know grasping at straws sometimes but sometimes it hits you over the head yeah it's amazing stuff even when i started reading your first book i think i told you that in the first email owl starts hooting outside like it never happens it's 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 become so common that i don't know i, I wish i had like some magical perfect thing to say i don't i'm <laughs> i'm i'm used to it right so the but i'm still in awe and confounded by it i mean if someone had told me like you know, like took me aside in junior high school and said, you know, when you're 54 years old, you know, this is what's going to happen. Like people are going to go write a book on owls and people are going to read the book and hear owls out their window. I would look, what? It wouldn't make any sense at all to me. And it's happening right now. It doesn't, I mean, I under, I make sense on sort of a deep intuitive level. And at the same time, I'm still in awe. Were you fascinated by stranger things when you were a kid? Well, I was just the perfect age for things like um, there was a TV show with Leonard Nimoy called In Search Of. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I was just, so I loved it. I loved that kind of stuff. And I remember getting the UFO kind of time life UFO books out of the library and stuff like that. So I had a, I was interested in all kinds of dumb stuff. I loved Jaws and science fiction and monster movies and Godzilla and stuff like that. So it kind of, so there was nothing, I mean, that, you know, I was that type of kid, so. Well, I've always been very affected, or not affected, but fascinated by, uh the mind having an effect on the material world. And it seems like there's a point in your book where you talk with Kirby, Dr. Kirby surprise. Mm-hmm. Yes. And he, he's of the, the mindset that you, we actually manifest our synchronicities, right? He is very formal in his, his, his thought process. He says, you know, so he says it's, you can do an experiment, right? You, this has been done for a hundred years. You can sit and you have a, coin toss, rolling the dice, any number of random things. Mm-hmm. And you can, you can make an intention. Like I want heads more than tails if I toss the coin and it'll happen. You know, it, it shouldn't, right? It should be completely random. And, but it, it's not. So somehow you are affecting reality. We have the ability to affect reality. Um, and, you know, so he says, you know, the gambler can have a lucky streak. And, and he, so he's, he's, a, he's a practicing clinician. So he has this, uh, I'm not sure if he's a doctor of psychology or psychiatry. But so, you know, he's meeting with patients and he has schizophrenic patients and they're saying they're following me. They're totally following me. And the paranoia, you know, the, the government secret agents are following me. It's like, well, let's, let's just prove this. So he takes the guy to the, to the window. And sure enough, there's this really slow black car with these guys in black suits and black sunglasses driving by exactly as the guy says he's being followed by the, by the secret government. And Kirby was like, did, how did that, you know, like they could have been just looking for an address, yeah, sure. but it was ominous and he recognized it. So he said, did this, did he manifest it? Did the guy who was, whose mind was so, had such a hyper focus, you know, and I was 
And so when I said, listen, I'm, I'm plagued with owls. I see owls all the time. They're happening to me all the time, waking up in the middle of the night with owls, owl, everything, owl. And he says, well, you're, you're putting a lot of energy into it and the universe is just a giant copying machine. It's just a giant Xerox machine. It's reflecting back, mm-hmm. right? So you're the, you're the parakeet in the cage, tapping on that mirror, trying to figure out what the other parrot is doing. It's the parakeet, it's you, it's the, you're, it's the mirror. So you're, we're, I'm like furiously tapping this mirror, like why owls, why owls, why owls? And it's reflecting back exactly the energy I'm putting into it. Um, I have been much calmer. The, the first book was, uh, was my therapy. It's like a five year intensive self therapy. And I came out of it a much calmer person. I mean, I told you before, like I thought I was going insane. I, I much calmer now. The second book, I was working with other people telling their stories. So it was like, there was like a couple of stories, it took two years of back and forth emails to tell these stories. And in doing so, these, not all of them, but a handful of people in the book, there's 19 stories in the book, a few folks basically had the transformative experience of like coming to terms with their experiences through the process of working with me. So I felt like I had that to give back. I, I got it from myself in the first book and I gave it back in the second book a little bit to some folks. It was remarkable. And it, and it, and it was palpable. Like I knew it when it was happening. Mm-hmm. I was like, wow, this is remarkable. That's great. It's fantastic. Did you know, all, just as an aside, that Dr. Kirby Surprise is also a shaman? I he was very, he said, he said some stuff under his breath that I was like, that does not surprise me. He felt very, yes. He did never said he was a shaman, but you're saying that is like, yeah, that makes sense. He, and he's, he was the smartest guy I've ever talked to. And have you ever met him and talked to him? No, I want to. Oh, if you're doing a show like this, you should get him on. He's remarkable, wonderful guy. And, um, his book is great and he's funny and, 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 uh, yeah, so he was great, remarkable, and I and I did huge excerpts of. I mean, I was I recorded a talk, and and that was one of my favorite chapters in the book, the Kirby Surprise book. What he did say, which is very interesting, because this is synchronicity. Oh, so a couple of things in his book. <laughs> I remember reading his book, and he's because I I contacted him. I sent him a letter, an email, and I said, "Hi, my name's Mike. I'm doing this research on UFOs and owls, and um, I feel that they're connected, and I feel that the people with UFO abduction experiences are are are." are having more experiences with owls as well as synchronicity. Mm-hmm. He sends me this letter back and it's, I'm paraphrasing from memory and it was like, you know, well, that's all well and good, but you know, just, just from my direct experience with UFOs and owls, you know, like I, I think you're, you're not, you're missing the point a little bit. And I'm like, wait a minute, a guy who writes a book on conspiracy or on, on synchronicity sees UFOs and owls. He's like, from my direct experience with UFOs. And then I get his book and he says, so he says, you know, you can, synchronicity is playful. Like it's like an, and I'm reading the book and he says, you know, he says all these, you can just ask synchronicity to, to be playful. You can ask for things through synchronicity. It's testable. Just do it. And so he says, you know what I like to do? It's on page 243. You know what I like to do? I like to ask for owls. I like I'm freaking almost drop the book. And I'm like, <laughs> ah, this is like the synchronicity book. And he's, then then when I talked to him directly, so you know what I used to, and he gave me permission to say all this. I was like, he's like, Initially, it was like, don't tell anyone this. And I, I've been very cautious how he phrased it because he was very cautious how he phrased it to me. So he has a boy, he was meditating a lot. I think he, he was like, started meditating when he was nine years old or something like that. There's not many people who can say that. Yeah. And, and, uh, and he was seeing UFOs. He could call them, call them in, like little dots. People would be with him and there'd be little like dots that would zigzag in the sky. And he's like, there's going to be one right there. And sure enough, there was one there. What? That's and crazy. Yeah, and he since I think he does he says that 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 waned that that at a certain point, mm-hmm. but um, you know, so yeah, this is so so the meditation, the shamanism, the owls, the UFOs, it's they're like these are all glued together. Like I don't even I say it in the talks I give talks and I have this slide it says owls synchronicity UFOs and they have little equal signs between them. Are they, are they all the same thing? And I, of course they're not the same thing, but I'm treating them as the same thing. They all have a transformative power, right? So I have stories where people have seen um, owls at really highly charged moments that's changed their lives. I have stories of people who've seen UFOs that's changed their lives. I have people who had powerful synchronicities and it's changed their lives. Mm-hmm. So these things, owls, synchronicities, and UFOs, I'm treating them as, as if they're the same thing. Someone tells me a story. I have a powerful synchronicity story. I will treat it with the same. I I don't separate them at all. 
And you also people using uh, psychedelics, in particular mushrooms, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I've got a handful of stories of those, and those are, um, and that that's so so mushroom is can be taken uh, in a in a in a spiritual setting, in a in a you know like a of a ceremonial setting, you know, for, and so I have a wonderful story of this woman. Um, and I compared and trashed a handful of stories. There's the favorite chapter. My favorite chapter of the book is called back to back stories. This woman, Shauna home was like going to do her first. She'd been working as a shamanic apprentice and she'd always done her mushroom trips with a, with a guide with the, with her, with her guru is the wrong term, but with her elder shaman with her. And, um, and so she sat alone in her bedroom and took, five ounces or five grams of mushrooms and like, and all of a sudden the room was filled with white feathers and all the walls were covered with white feathers. And there was a 10 foot tall giant owl that was standing there in the room talking to her, this woman owl. And she knew it was a female owl and, and it was ushering her from mother to crone. It was the transformative experience. So she, you know, there's these three stages of womanhood and the maiden, the mother, the crone. So she was being ushered from, one chapter of life to this new chapter of life. She said everything changed after that. She started doing her own practice. She started doing her own shamanic work. And, um, you know, that's just one story. Now, there was another woman. She's actually, um, her name is Leslie in the book. She has given me her permission to use her real name. And her real name is Lori McDonald. And she's a, she's a hypnotherapist out of California. And she said UFO contact experiences. And she's with her son. So I get one story on a Monday and the next story on a Tuesday. Shauna Holm talks. I talked to Shauna Holm on a Monday. I talked to, to um, Laurie McDonald on a Tuesday. And Laurie McDonald says, I had an experience with my son. My son was showing kind of psychic skills. He seemed to be very intuitive and very... So I, I, um, I said, let's set the cards out. He was about nine years old. And we set the cards out. And I said, pick the cards. And he was, guess the card, guess the next card. He's doing really well. Just simple, like what's the next dice throw kind of thing, turning over cards in the backyard. And as they're doing it, this picnic table in the yard, this white owl lands on the tree. This owl stayed with them for years. They'd go to the grocery store. The owl would fly to the grocery store. They'd be at the grocery store. The owl would wait outside at the or light post. They'd come back home. The owl would come back home with them. This was at the point when she was coming to terms with her own contact experiences and looking into becoming a, hy a hypnotherapist. She actually moved away from the house to, to take, to study hypnotherapy. and. After she left the house, she got a phone call from her next door neighbor and said, your, your owl, I have this terrible news. We found your owl dead in the yard. Mm. And she broke her heart. It was really traumatic for her, both her and her son. And she feels like the owl had done its duty, had done its job, and it simply died. Now, when I compare the Lori and Shauna Holm, there are so many similarities in their lives their age, their birthday, they're, they're both Canadian, um, they're both adopted, and they both have like very striking eyes. So this, and that was Monday, Tuesday, same story. And actually when I called, this is so funny, this is typical, like I, I had a scheduled phone call to talk to Lori McDonald. And, said, like, and I checked, I called, I said, I emailed her first, just said, hey, I'm going to call. We have an appointment to call, talk today. I'm just going to, how's the time? Good time to talk? She said, yeah, you know what just happened? I'm on my porch. This owl just flew by. It's like, how often does that happen? No, never. Never, never hit this house. Never seen one. It's like, I'm like about to call you. I'm like, that's then I pick up the phone. So that was the email. Like, she's like, basically, oh, it just happened. Just now. This is, I have, I have no idea. So basically what it says is like, I'm on to something. <laughs> like, like whatever's going on, like, you know, earlier I said, like, I'm so glad I'm pulling on this thread, this like corner of the UFO field. And it's been like so fruitful. It's amazing. And I like how you described uh, what, <clears throat> what fascinates you about the dynamic of all of this is sort of, it's like a, the unresolvable, f uh, uh, what's the word that I'm looking for? Uh, where you tell stories around the fire, campfire story. Oh, the campfire story. Yeah. Yeah, that's a perfect for you know it's really funny because i went through my old blog the very first blog post i wrote this little essay in kind of a flurry like it's about about cat my cat my cat might be in the room here with me but the cat like you play with a string right and the cat gets all crazy they look at the string it's the strings on the floor ah and they're playing it they're totally dynamic and they're totally like enthralled by the string and it like brings out their catness the cat doesn't realize that the string is connected to me 
right? They're looking at the string on the floor. They're not looking at me. And that's what I'm thinking. Like, we're like, oh my God, the UFO, look at the UFO. How, oh, it's my career, oh, the UFO. But like, what's, what's, who's pulling the string of that UFO? That's the real question for me. And in that essay, which I wrote in 2006, I talk about the campfire story. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, this is something that I've been like, has been bubbling up for 20 years or so. Um, so yes, yeah, so the, the campfire story, the, the best campfire story, you don't like the person doesn't tell the campfire story and then pause and go, now here's what it means, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. You have to kind of just let it sit and it's in the campfire story. has got this kind of absurdist quality to it. Sure. And, and I even say, be, I mean, this is I, in the second book in the, in the, in the, um, I think it's in the introduction I write that I hope these stories that I'm sharing are told around the campfire someday. Absolutely. So, I mean, they have that quality to them. Yes, for sure. That's perfect. Um, I won't keep you much longer. Have you ever had any personal psychedelic experiences? Well, I went to high school in the seventies. <laughs> so I'm not sure what I can say. Like, like the black helicopters are going to come in and take <laughs> me away. I what I did in the seventies, but I would say I took Mushrooms and LSD um, in my youth. I'm now 54. I think I've like crossed the the line where they they can. Uh, but um, the statute of limitations is long, long, long since. So yes, I did, and I found it, and it was like it was not ceremonial at all. I'm talking this was like party, yeah. you know. So I was like there was nothing, there was nothing ceremonial. But I can tap into that 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 mystical power that it has. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Even if you were taking it and going to an amusement park or something. <laughs> well, I lived in New York City at the time, uh -huh. so it was kind of like being an amusement park. Exactly. Yeah, so. Exactly. Uh, have you ever had any um, recent encounters, or or feel like you've had any contact with UFOs? Or well, there's a story that the last forty pages of the book or so oh. are is this. Have you have you gotten that far? Have you seen any of my talks online or anything? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, so the last half hour of the talks is is this event that took place in 2013. Um, March 10th of 2013, I call it my awakening experience to tell it properly. It takes about a half hour or so, but, um, the answer would be that was, that was the most recent thing with that kind of power. Mm -hmm. And I, I was sleeping outside under the, under the stars in Southern Utah. And I looked up at a hill and I said, that looks just like a landed flying saucer. You know, you're in the desert. It's kind of scrubby trees. And I looked at this thing and I said to myself, like, I'm hot stuff. Like I got synchronicities and I'm a vegetarian. I go to UFO conferences. Like if this was, a, if this was a flying saucer, I'd know it. Like I'd feel it intuitive. And like I'm laying there totally silent, no one around. And I'm like, nope, don't feel a thing. Don't feel a thing. And then I, a bunch of stuff happened that night. A coyote howled near my head. This is another, this is this mythic archetypal animal. It was so close. I, I don't understand why I couldn't see it. It felt like I could have taken a dog biscuit and out of my sleeping bag and kind of gone, and I could have caught it. Mm -hmm. uh, I never saw it. It was. I've slept out a thousand nights in the West. I've never been that close to a coyote. It. Um, and then a third time I woke up that night and there was a bright light behind the bush. And I kind of sat up and I did the thing. We're like, what is that on the other side? And I was like, doesn't look like a car headlights, doesn't look like flashlight. I'll just go back to sleep. So this is all very strange. Now I got home and I was like, I gotta figure out what that round building was up on that hillside. And I got on Google Maps, it was nothing. I'm very, very skilled with maps. I did a lot of outdoor work in my in sort of teaching outdoors for close to 20 years. So I'm very, very skilled with maps. Found it on Google Maps, found the exact spot, found the hillside, found the little saddle, the little feature that the and there was nothing there. And I was like, this thing would be a big, big, big house. It was 1.6 miles away and it was nothing. I drew a picture of it. I post, posted it online. It got posted at 1, 2, 3, 4, 1234. Then, and, and then I had a psychic vision of a map of Southern Utah with three points on it. Now, the one point was the one I had had two nights before. By the time I did the drawing and posted it online and then had the psychic vision, um, and this stuff, and then these three events lined, uh, two other events that sound very much like UFO contact mm -hmm. um, line up exactly on the map. In this line stretches 200 and 
31 miles long. And to tell the story properly there, it is every synchronicity. I mean, it is just like, the, it's like, oh, and then this happened and this happened and this is connected here and this is this and this town, like this is the name of this town. And it was, it just goes on and on and on. Now I'll tell you, here's something that I've just been sharing recently. So I, I had a hypnosis session with Yvonne Smith in August. Now I'm very cautious of hypnosis as far as a, as far as a tool for this kind of thing. I mean, I think it's, let's just, I'm cautious, right? So if someone, someone, you can make a very good argument that hypnosis might not be the best thing to do, but like, I feel like I've explored every avenue that I can. And so I'm just like, okay, I'm going to make, take this next step. I told her, let's talk about this, that event that night. And, and I, and we talked about a couple other things, but that night and and then I said, Oh, and then during this, um, just drop the question like about the owls. And she said, Okay, so I'm we talking this a lot of stuff came up and I don't know what to trust, but and then she said, And Mike, you know, what's your connection with owls? And then and there was this kind of pause and, and very clearly I said, The owls are not important. Now, and this is I this is I said the owl is a symbol that is thumbtacked to the door. The door is important. The owl is simply a symbol. It's the correct symbol for the door, but it's the doorway that's important. And this, as I'm saying this, do you write it all? Yeah. Well, okay. not not very. So you, every once in a while, when you're writing, right, you write. You're like, oh yeah, this is good. Like this, like I'm not. I'm. This is just coming out of me. Like I don't know where this is coming from, and I'm like. Ooh, yeah, this is like, even in the moment, like laying there with my eyes closed, all calm on the couch. I'm like, this is good stuff. So I say, this is pretty close. Like, cause I just, I just have been transcribing this, this thing. So the, we are in a claustrophobic hallway and the owl is on the door. It's the door that is important. And beyond the door, is an infinite vastness. And in my mind, I pictured this like kind of like narrow hallway in a dingy hotel and just you open one door and it was like this special effect from like Doctor Who where it was just like <laughs> galaxy above galaxy all folded in on each other. And, and I was in essence saying, and I kind of knew it at the time when I said infinite vastness, I, I could have said God. So, and it was so poetic and it came out of nowhere. Um, and I, so that, so yes, so my subconscious, when my subconscious, someone asked my subconscious, what's the meaning of the owls? My answer was the owls aren't important. They are simply a sign on the door, which I thought was just as poetic. And, and then when I'm like, well, no, why did I write 700 pages of two books that total up to 700 pages? No. <laughs> you could have just written a pamphlet. I could have, yeah, I could have just <laughs> contact an owl under a door. Yeah, so. <laughs> a picture of an owl. I wouldn't do that with a nice owl. Yes, but. exactly. I knew what you meant. Yeah. Well, I think that's a, that's a fantastic note to leave on, but uh, I think that what you're doing is amazing and you're still collecting stories, right? People can go to your website and, they can find it. If you want to find me, just Google. So here's the short Google UFO owl. I'm going to be the first thing that comes up. I've got a website that where it's a blog where I've uh, archived tons of stuff. I'm actually working on a, like I want to put out like a collection of blog posts. Oh yeah. That'd be great. And it's, well, it's, ugh, it's a bottomless pit. I'm kind of like, Oh my gosh, there's a lot here. It was kind of like, it's, and then, so I, that's been a big job. And cause there's, and then, um, uh, so that's the blog is called hidden experience. Mm-hmm. And um, so you can Google hidden experience blog. It'll come right up or you can Google UFOs owls. It'll come right up or you can Google my name, Mike Cleland and um, it'll, you'll, it'll come right up. And then uh, there's a couple other sites I have most that are just like a book promotion mm-hmm. site kind of thing. So, sure. but, um, and then if you want the books, Amazon is the easiest way to get it. I think that's sad to say, but we're all beholden to the, you know, big corporate giant there to, to, you know, we can go to a local bookstore mm-hmm. and walk up to the nice person at the counter and say, can you order this book? And they'll do it for you. So you might, they'll, and they'll, it, they don't, you, they, there'll be no shipping. So you'll save a couple bucks if you do it that way. Fantastic. And can they get them actually from your site or do they have, will that just lead? No, they'd have to go to, it just, it just forwards you know, to Amazon. And you also have an archive of six years of your own podcast there too. I have six years of podcasting, which is, I, you know what happened? And now this is on it. Like, the book was therapy, right? All of a sudden I got stuck in the book and I'm like, like, I got to fit. Like, I got to like, 
prioritize the book, 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 nothing but the owls and nothing but the book. And then I didn't do any podcasting. And, um, and the podcasting was therapy. You can hear it in there. You can hear it. Like, I'm like, oh my God, I got to talk to this person. How am I going to talk to him? Like, I'll just, I'll start a podcast and I'll interview him and I'll get all my answers. It's funny because one of the questions I asked everyone, it's so funny. Like the two questions I asked every person, what is, what do you, how would you define shaman? And then I would say, do you know about owls and UFOs and the cotton? And they're like, oh yeah, what about owls? And then I said, what's the meaning of the owls? Those are the two questions I asked everyone. And that has been like the, right from the very beginning. And that has been the core of like the, the book projects and stuff like that. So, Have you ever, real, real quickly, have you ever had any sort of past life regression or anything like that? I have. That's when you get, if that, that is like, so that's what the, there's like, it's a huge essay in the book. So, I mean, I went through, so I had a history of depression. I still, I mean, I, I, I have a history of depression mm-hmm. and, and I would talk to people on Leo Sprinkle. I talked to Leo Sprinkle and he would hear me out and he's like, you don't, you don't need a UFO thing. Just get a past life regression. And I met this woman, her name is Lorraine Flaherty. I met her in London at a conference and I, she was very English, very proper. And I told her my thing like, Oh God, I got this thing. And I, you know, like, and I, in my history of depression, she said, well, you should, let's try a past life regression thing. So it was about, I don't know, it felt like, f- it, it was, it felt like f- half hour. I was under there for like three and a half hours, but it felt like, whoosh, whoosh. and I got, and I listened to the thing. So the story that emerged that was, I don't trust it entirely. It was, it's one of these things that's totally like, it's like a comic book that's so over the top and it's drama. And so I was a, I was a young artist in England in the 1920s and I was very arrogant and very, I was full of myself and I was beaten blind. Wow. And so all of a sudden I was, I was beaten blind by my father. My father then killed himself. And it was like this, like, uh, it was just like, and I'm crying and I'm telling this story and I don't know where it's coming from. And it's just like, and then, and my, it's like, and, and then there was this whole thing where like, okay, did you learn the lesson from that life? And did, why did you, you, did you take it through this life? And Lorraine Flaherty went through a very formal set of like visualizations. Let's visualize the contract you had in that life. Hmm. Are you done with that? Yes, I'm done with it. Like, let's rip it up. That's okay. And I came out of the, I came out of the session and I mean, I, I sat up in that chair and I was like, it's over. I'm cured. And it hasn't come back. I have no idea whether it was real or not. Hmm. And I mean, the story was outrageously over the top. I mean, you couldn't, if like you wrote an opera, like it would, this was over the top for, you know, so, um, and I'm, and I've been, I still get, you know, whatever rainy days on a weekend. I'm like, Oh, you kind of get kind of low energy or something like that. But it ain't, I have not had clinical depression since for five years or something now. Thank the owl. Which is, yeah. Or thank, I mean, thank this, this simple three hours in a hypnotherapist couch. Sure. And you were the one telling the story, right? She just prompted. It was emerging for me. She was prompting me. Wow. Like, she was basically this call and response. I have the whole thing transcribed and it, it's, it, yeah, it's pretty heavy to read it, but I don't think it really happened. Like, I don't think I lived that previous life. I may have, but I don't care. Right. So all I care about is the benefit, right? Now, so basically I don't care whether it's the, the red pill or the placebo or the real therapeutic pill. Like I am, I'm cured. So knock wood here. I'm knocking wood at my desk as I say that. Interesting that you weren't an artist in that life though too. Oh yeah. There was all kinds of things that were parallel. It's funny. I had, as I had my hair, you know, like I remember thinking, Oh my God, I've got my hair back. <laughs> like, I'm just like, Oh my God. I remember thinking like, Oh, it's like, I was like very arrogant. And I was like sort of the 1920s with the greased hair and mm-hmm. call me back. Like, oh. <laughs> so you were like there, you were back in that little, little snippets. And, but I remember saying it, you know, like, like, wow, I really am. So, <laughs> well, at least your takeaway was more than just the hair. It was something. Yes. I, I took, I, 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 I shredded a contract. I lived some horrible existence if it's or metaphorically or literally, I don't know, but I lived some, some dark existence and that I, something got cleansed. Mm-hmm. Good for you. You know, Fantastic. Well, Mike, thanks so much. For, oh, this was a great, this yeah. was totally awesome. Yeah, so. likewise. And I hope that we have a good excuse to do it sometime in the future. Are you there? If you ever want to read a second book about owls, yeah. I mean, I'm only, I mean, I got more like, I got, I'll, 
I mean, I can go on and on and on. I, so. Sure, sure. And if you have <laughs> scraps that, that didn't make it into the book or anything like that in, a, in an emailable form, I, I'm all ears. So, okay. yeah, yeah, always. Um, well, I mean, I'm getting I'm getting story after story. This That little story I talked about, the kite and the string, was just like that one little snippet was just like, wow. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. That's, yeah. Yeah, like so many of these stories are. Well, thank you so much for your time, sir. Great. This was a delight. Yes. A wonderful meeting you. Yes. And uh, hopefully we'll, we'll cross paths again in the future. Good. All right. Good. I will look forward to meeting you sometime. Yes. Take care, Mike. Right. Adios. Farewell. All right. That was an excellent talk. I enjoyed that thoroughly. Mike Clellan is a great guy. He really is. And uh, I really appreciate uh, the sense of wonder that he brings to his work. And I think he, his attitude towards what he's doing as far as sort of being the <laughs> the owl guy, as he is termed on the internet, um, is he is willing to take leaps with making connections between things. He's, he remains open to the possibility of of something that he may not be able to wrap his mind around at the, in the present time, but he's open-minded enough to even consider the possibility that somehow maybe these things, all of these things are connected together. And I think it's exactly that open-mindedness and wonder that I would like to typify at the melt and with the sorts of stories that people tell here and the sorts of guests that I have on is that open-mindedness and that inquiry and that curiosity that I think are so pertinent in life in every aspect. Um, if you lose that, then that's sort of when you start to calcify. That's sort of when cynicism can creep in and you begin to think that you know what the world and the universe is and reality, quote unquote. And once you think that you have that all wrapped up with a nice neat little bow on top, you stop exploring. You turn off the flashlight and you go about your business. You, you go, you, then your, your goal in life becomes to deaden the pain that's the existential pain that sets in from endless repetition of, of ritual and ceremony and occupation and just try to grit your teeth and make the best of it instead of thinking that there could be anything else out there, many more possibilities in your life. So Mike was great at that. He had great enthusiasm. It was wonderful to talk to him. I can't wait to have an excuse to talk with him again. It's fantastic. All right. So uh, episode three of The Melt. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you have any ideas about guests or any feedback, you can always email me at themeltpodcast at gmail.com. We have a Patreon page which is www.patreon.com slash the melt podcast. You can go there and you can become a patron, which means that it's sort of like a subscription. Um, you can set it up, set up an, an account and it will take a little bit out of your bank account every month. And that can be $1. That could be $1,000, anything in between. Um, it is your choice. I don't want to, at least I, I don't find it necessary currently to have pay grades or a sort of a gate that you get more information after you've paid your admission. Uh, I want everybody to have access to the same core information, but maybe have, as, uh, have access to um, different aspects of that same information. For instance, uh, what I have up on the Patreon page now are some video versions of interviews that I've done on the podcast and from uh, episodes that haven't even aired yet. And I will continue to do that as I collect them. Those will always be there. Other things will appear there too. I'm just not sure. I'm kind of uh, letting it evolve as organically as it needs to be. So go and check that out. I highly urge you to. And the Melt Podcast is also on Facebook and um yeah, I want to thank uh, Cami Kennedy for, for the owl story that started off the whole episode, and I would like to thank Mike Clellan again for a wonderful talk. Until next time. Mm -hmm.